very ancient uh, to a very ancient tradition built over a machine of similar form capable of traveling over great distances and for very long times in Alexandria Egypt jet engines in uh, T L A L E L A C O Tolalak Co, Mexico, I guess that is, found 20 feet underground an object which looks like a miniature jet engine. In Ecuador, copper gears with a hardness comparable to steel, indicating that they were designed for heavy mechanical use. Ecuador, copper and stone mechanical devices with circular rollers, bearing an uncanny resemblance to modern, modern metal fabricating machines. In Greece, a machine tool for cutting screws. In Greece, a machine for boring tunnels. In Egypt, drills for boring into granite rock that turned 500 times faster than modern power drills. In Turkey, drills that bored holes finer than the thinnest needle in hard stone. In Mexico, a five-ton steamroller for road maintenance. In Egypt, a fire engine with a double-action pump. In Greece, screw pumps, an ingenious interacting system of levers, pulleys, and grips for lifting great weights, one use of which was to grab, tilt, and sink enemy ships. In France, a sculptured block discovering among Ro- discovered among Roman remains showing a multiple harvester used in reaping grain. In Panama, a stylized model of an ancient geared earth-moving machine, and it contains a system of mechanical gears, including cog wheels on an axle with a rocker arm between them with two more rocker arms in the rear and a jaguar mouth with teeth like bucket grabs the spade like features on on uh, the side and rear are very obvious if this is a prehistoric model of a real working vehicle it would explain some of the construction triumphs of the ancient americas in ecuador was found mechanical corn mills wheeled and geared in Peru, stone engravings show people operating unknown machines. In Crete, remains of puzzling apparatuses have been found in the palaces and workshops of Nassos. In Peru, a clay vessel portrays a man using the index fingers of both hands to operate a kind of calculating machine or a switchboard. In Crete, the <coughs> Phaistos spelled P-H-A-I-S-T-O-S, I presume that's Phaistos disc discovered in 1908, shows evidence of having been printed using movable type recurring symbols impressed individually. This shows the principle of the printing of type, or printing by type, was known in very early times. Evidence as to whether it was ever used on paper and other materials is probably lost forever. Ancient mounds in Michigan and the United States have likewise yielded objects which appear to have been impressed with dies or type pieces. Now, here's one that was accidentally found in 1885 when a block of coal was broken open in the Austrian foundry of Isidore Braun of uh, Wacklerbruck. Braun's son took the mysterious cube to the Salzburg Museum, where it underwent examination by the Austrian physicist Karl Gurls, spelled G-U-R-L-S. Now, Derek D. Sola Price's reconstruction of a calendar computer built by the Greeks about 65 B.C. and found by sponge divers off the island of... uh, A-N-T-I-K-Y-T-H-E-R-A Antikythria, I guess that is. Uh, Now, going back here to the object found in the coal. The object was clearly machine fabricated with smooth, sharp surfaces. Four of its sides were flat and the two remaining sides opposite each other were convex. A deep, even groove can completely or ran completely around it. It remained on exhibit at the museum until 1910. An account of its discovery was published in the scientific journals Nature in London in 1886 and La Astronomie Paris in 1897. It is of antediluvial origin and it is apparently a piece of some machine destroyed and buried during the Great Flood. 
Then there is in the United States, England, Germany, Russia, Italy, and France, similar objects with interesting angles that have been discovered elsewhere. In China and Peru, a seismograph providing data to pinpoint the epicenter of an earthquake anywhere in the world. The application of scientific principles here implied postulates a knowledge of the earth structure and of the propagation of waves. In Egypt, 2nd century AD, Athens, Greece, coin slot machines for holy water, the quantity depending on the coin inserted. Egypt. An automaton in the form of a clock was discovered after the Muslim conquest of Egypt by one of the first caliphs of Cairo and described in an Arab manuscript known as the Murtadi. It was made of red gold and covered with precious stones with two shiny gems for eyes. The cock, when approached, uttered a frightening cry and began flapping its wings. Now these are machines, boys and girls, and in the section here on, let me find this again over here, mechanical devices, number 17, that's chapter 17, there are 42 of these, beginning on page 219. Um, all of these residues of automation in the past, or in a past technological era, I should uh, qualified that not all scientific achievements of the past were a legacy from before the flood. There were natural social factors, of course. However, some achievements of early history and prehistory cannot be defined as creation of man's mind at that time because economic and social conditions were not ripe for them. They would have to be an inheritance from an earlier period. A mechanical effect of stunning beauty may soon be discovered in the Lin Tiong district of China. Here, where China's earliest emperors lived and died, widespread excavations are presently being undertaken. The most staggering finds are yet to be made. Hidden beneath the picturesque landscape lie hundreds of undisturbed imperial tombs, which are filled with art treasures and riches. In 100 BC, the Chinese chronicler Summa Qin, C-H-I-E-N, I guess that's Qin, described unbelievable treasures constructed within the tomb of the first emperor, Qin Shi Huang, T constellations, regions of the earth, and contemporary buildings were all reproduced. All the rivers of the country, the Yellow River and the Yangtze, were reproduced in quicksilver and made to flow into a miniature ocean through some mechanical means. The location is known. The tube under a mound overgrown with trees and wildflowers towers 165 feet, that's 16 stories high, against the northern foothills of Mount Li in the Wei River Valley of Kansu Province. The archaeologists who finally penetrate this tomb had better take care. The ancient chronicler warned that weaponry was set up so that any robber break Breaking in would be killed. Now, let's take a look at everyday items. Could photographic and listening devices have been known and used in the very distant past? Sounds like an outrageous suggestion, surely. So let me introduce you to some Indian records dating to the second millennium BC and considered to be copies of still older documents, whereas the writings of most other nations suffered willful destruction. These have, by some miracles, survived. I might point out here that two huge museums, one in Alexandria, Egypt, with more than a million volume, volumes, was destroyed by Julius Caesar. They burned it. The Romans were great destroyers. They were the engines of destructions, not of civilization. In Carthage, there was a second library reported to have more than half a million volumes, which was also destroyed by the Russians, uh, by, by the Romans. They present epics of gods and men interspersed with such wealth of a scientific nature that much of it was considered absurd when translated in the last century. Modern science is today catching up with many of the concepts expressed in these documents. Scientists in many countries are now studying a remarkable translation made by Maharishi Bharadwaja. I'll spell that for you in case you want to check me out. And it's spelled uh, Maharishi is the first name. I can pronounce that one. But the second one is B-H-A-R-A-D-W-A-J-A. And it's called Aeronautics, described as a manuscript from the prehistoric past. It contains fascinating, almost incredible data. The translation has been published by the International Academy of Sanskrit Research in Mysore, India. Its table of contents includes the secret of constructing airplanes, which will not break, which cannot be cut, will not catch fire, and cannot be destroyed. 
the secret of making planes motionless, the secret of hearing conversations and other sounds in enemy planes, and the secret of receiving photographs of the interior of enemy planes and more. Take merely the photographic and audio references in this ancient document. Impossible questions arise unless we are prepared to understand that there must have been a higher culture and technology or an equally perfect technology before our own. Many isolated clues from around the world, inconsequential in themselves, but cumulatively meaningful, show that everyday items familiar to us today were known and used throughout the prehistoric world. Significantly, these are found in the ruins of inferior civilizations after the superior technology had long vanished. They are suggestive of what must have preceded them. So here are some of the more modest inventions, but nonetheless surprising to us, that can be found in the minor pages of archaeology. Egypt, 2750 BC. Envelopes were used for letters and sealed with the sender's private seal. Egypt, 2500 BC, 11 rusted razor blades with hieroglyphic writing on them. I might pause here to point out that in the Bible, when the story of Joseph was told, Joseph shaved before he went in to see Pharaoh. In Babylon, the sulfur matches. In T-H-E-R-A, Thera, 1500 BC, boxing gloves. In India, Thimbles. In Egypt, 2700 BC, Ur of Chaldea. Costa Rica to Colombia, silver and gold foil. In Ecuador, a plaque depicts a clerk writing with a quill pen in a surprisingly modern book. In general, evidence for paper books has been found on all continents except Australia. In Peru, books and paintings and hieroglyphics. Of course, this refutes the conventional assumption that writing was unknown in South America. In Guatemala and Egypt, books made of gold leaves. In Syria, 1400 BC, several rooms in one library were devoted entirely to just dictionaries and lexicons. In Egypt, China, and India, technological textbooks. In Turkey, rulers and compasses were used when making elaborate drawings for frescoes. In Armenia, 2500 BC, metallic paint. Metallic paint, unknown until recent times. Egypt, 3000 BC, a segmented box similar to that used today for cutlery. Egypt, camping equipment. Guatemala, diving suits. In Egypt, plastics, glass which could be bent and yet not broken, was reported by the Arab historian Ibn Abid Hok, spelled I-B-N, A-B-D, H-O-K-H, to have been buried in ancient vaults. Peru, plastics, small tubes of a material like glass, but not glass, and of an unknown chemical composition were found in graves in the 1940s. In Turkey, drinking straws. In Egypt, 3000 BC, southern Turkey and Central America, forks and spoons. In Chaldea, knives of 2.8% tin. In India, aluminum cups. In Bolivia, England, Chaldea, Mexico and Peru, finely executed gold dinnerware. In Crete, glazed dinnerware and tinted glass goblets. In Rome, thermos containers keeping liquids and foods either hot or cold were in common use. In Turkey, furniture decorated with gold and silver, bronze legs and tables and beds shaped like goat's feet or horse's hooves. In Israel, 850 B.C., beds and ornaments of color stained ivory. In Ecuador, a magnificent golden bed inscribed with hieroglyphics. In Israel, chairs of ebony inlaid with ivory and lapis lazuli. I don't know what a lapis lazuli is. That's spelled L-A-P-I-S. L-A-Z-U-L-I. In Samaria, 3000 B.C. and in Ecuador, modern quality musical instruments in great variety. In Syria, a musical notation on a 3,400-year-old clay tablet. When translated and played, it sounds very pleasing to the modern Western ear. Not unlike guitar music, it was probably written for a harp-accompanied 
soloist. And in Arizona and uh, the Maya, and in Mexico, uh, the Maya in Mexico, they found rubber balls. Now there are 39 common items that we take for granted today as being very modern. These are called everyday items. These modern everyday items were known as far back as 3,000 years ago. Let me take one more. Clothing and adornment. Soak up the sun in your bikini or try on your pantsuit and wig and then off to a fashion parade. If 20th century historians call you primitive because you live thousands of years BC, then you can smile. Your jewelry is immaculate, you lack or you lack nothing in sophistication. Neither does your prehistoric husband live in a cave. He wear he wears well styled clothes and modern shoes, enough to give the traditional prehistorian a seizure. Now here's a short checklist. In the Gobi Desert, in Nevada, in the United States and in England has been found fossilized prehistoric shoe prints with nail heads around the edge as well as shoelaces. In Mexico, Peru, and Germany, gold and silver footwear with soft gold soles or rubber soles, gold embellished. In uh, Egypt and Borneo, finely woven textiles of extraordinary strength and delicacy, such as could only be produced in highly specialized factories today. In Peru and Mexico, cotton grown in various colors, from brown to blue, a technique which modern science has been unable to reproduce so far. In Peru, advanced dyeing techniques, fabrics covered with a mosaic of feathers in no less than 190 shades of color. Peru, magnificent textiles with veils, brocades, and goblins for finer or far finer than is possible on any modern loom today. Russia, 3000 BC, spindle whorls and patterned fabric designs. Peru, exquisitely patterned lace. Peru, clothing sewn artistically in multicolored designs with gold and silver thread. China, jade clothes composed of hundreds of pieces of tightly fitted jade particles sewn with golden thread. Mexico, waterproof clothing. China, modern jackets and long trousers depicted in underground tunnel paintings. South Africa, short sleeved pullovers, closely fitting breeches, gloves, garters and slippers and multicolored shirts. Russia, fur trousers, embroidered shirts, jackets with ivory badges and clasps. In Russia, two-piece suits styled very much as in the present day. In Crete, Asia Minor, and Egypt, all dated to 3000 BC, fashions were launched by the elegant women of Crete and imitated by other countries, such as very long skirts with flounces, full skirts with flounces, Bodices, whatever a B-O-D-I-C-E-S is, decorated with Medici-like collars. That's a M-E-D-I-C-I hyphen L-I-K-E collars. I imagine this is some kind of a clothing item that you ladies might reckon, recognize. Deeply cut in front, leaving the breasts visible. Hats of extravagance and variety. In France, pantsuits, short-sleeved jackets, decorated hats, small boots, and modern-looking purses. In Sicily, bikinis, modeled by skinny young girls posing in a mode similar to that of today. In Sumeria, 2900 BC, an amazingly modern wig. In in, uh, Thera Sumeria, T-H-E-R-A Sumeria, Uh, eyelid paint and eye makeup. In Egypt, a woman preserved in a tomb was wearing five shades of lipstick. Her hair had been in rollers and the curls were still in after 3,000 years. In uh, Bulgaria, large earrings, necklaces, and cosmetics and expensive jewelry used with sophistication. 
in uh, Mahin in Mahinjo Dero, Pakistan, 3000 BC. Jewels, rings, bracelets, and necklaces uh, necklaces of gold, silver, and ivory, kept in elegant silver caskets, and so well finished and so highly polished that it might have come out of a Bond Street jeweler's today. So much for a sampling of ancient fashions among the general populace. We see astonishing variety and opulence in clothing, also elegance in which good taste and coordination among clothes, hairdos, headwear, and jewelry prevailed. Beauty, sophistication matching our own, herbal drops were used to enlarge the pupils of the eyes, green eyeshadow, black eyeliner, face powder, and rouge were all used in great quantities, as was a bleaching paste for freckles. And from the earliest times, nails held a fascination. Manicuring implements were used, including a cuticle pusher, rather like an orange wood stick of today. Women colored their fingernails and toenails bright red. In taste, people were basically the same as today. And now there is, let me get this one, uh, mechanical devices, everyday items, and clothing. And this has all been dug up. There are 969 records of these kinds of items. Some of these are on display in some museums. Some of them are not. The author reports that most of this material is in packing crates in warehouses that museums all across the world refuse to put out on display because they refute or seriously put in danger the theory of evolution, which is our modern fairy tale that tells us long, long ago and far, far away. All right, we are reviewing the book, Dead Men's Secrets. I rate this about a 1 in 100 book. I'm an old man. I have never seen another book like it. I have read about some of these stories. I have seen pictures of the light bulbs that are depicted on the hieroglyphic murals in the tombs of Egypt. I have seen pictures of the Nazca uh, animals. I have uh, heard of and seen pictures of these huge uh, buildings, these uh, these uh, huge building blocks and rocks in Peru and Ecuador. Just little pieces here and there, you know, that I've read in Discover Magazine or Reader's Digest or some some uh, TV special or something like that. You probably have also. Now, this author, Jeffrey or Jonathan rather, it's Jonathan Gray, has put together a record of 969 records. The book is about 350 pages, paperback, published in 2004. It's called Dead Men's Secrets, Jonathan Gray. If only 10% of them are true, accurate, and correct, it's a blockbuster. I'm telling you, boys and girls, that of 10%, which would be about 100, 96.9, then all the rest of them were lies. You'd still be faced with an insurmountable problem concerning evolution. Where in the hell does this technology come from? We can't duplicate it today. Now, boys and girls, when there's something that I cannot do, it doesn't mean jack diddly squat. I remember years ago, I was uh, flying up to or back from, I guess, uh, Alaska. And I stopped for fuel at uh, SeaTac Airport there in uh, Seattle, Tacoma, they call it. SeaTac. It was about, it was in the late 60s or early 70s. My guess would be it was probably about 1972. Because I flew up to Alaska on that trip uh, in a Cherokee 6. And and uh, there was a 747 coming in for a landing. And I, I'd never seen one before. You know, I'd heard of them. You know, I'd seen pictures of them. But I'd never seen a real 747. And I was sitting on the tarmac out at the end of the runway, running up the uh, engines and doing my checkouts. And I looked up from the, <laughs> from the instrument panel. And I watched this humongous thingy suspended in the sky. It was moving very slowly. It was coming in for a landing. I stopped what I was doing because I couldn't believe what I was seeing with my own eyeballs. And I watched in absolute fascination. Boys and girls, I've been a pilot for years. I watched that 747 come in and land, and I I said, my God, how can that thing fly? How can that thing fly that slow? You know, the faster you run something through the air, the better it'll fly. I was absolutely amazed, and we're in modern times. Now, I showed you here that we have pictures and drawings. We have actual uh, artifacts of jet engines from ancient times. 
I'm not surprised after having seen this book, after having seen the pictures that are contained in the books, or in, in, in the pages of this book, that uh, this kind of technology was possible. Put it, put it to the test. Let's think about it for a minute. 500 years ago, we were pretty primitive people. You go back to the Middle Ages and Columbus discovering America. You know, these people don't have electric lights. They don't have batteries. They don't have rubber. They don't have plastic. Now, we go out here and, and we take a look around us today. We have plastic. We have rubber. We have metallurgy. And, you know, we accept it. You couldn't have a 747 without metallurgy. You've got to be able to combine various metals together in order to build an airplane like that. And yet we have those kinds of metallurgical samples today that came from ancient times. In the Bible, in Genesis 4, it says they were artificers in brass and iron. That's an indication of metallurgy. Now we come to anthropology. They run around and they're digging up these artifacts. An aluminum cup. Do you remember that statement? There was an aluminum cup. My God, boys and girls, aluminum wasn't discovered until the, the, the 20th century. I mean, yeah, we knew that there was a, was a mineral called aluminum. But this aluminum, you know, to make aluminum metal, that's only been discovered in the last hundred years. For somebody to have an aluminum cup that goes back into ancient times, it's like digging up a computer, for crying out loud, with microwave software, or Microsoft software. Uh, that's, that's unheard of. Now, there are sophisticated mechanical devices here that I told you about today. Let's take a look at another one. Flight. Airplanes. Flight. Now, when you take a look at flight, the first guy that got up off the ground was a Frenchman who, uh, I need to turn to page 277 here, that's what I'm kind of stalling around for. A Frenchman discovers a hot air balloon back around 1700, you know, in round numbers. Then from that first primitive flight in 1700, let's just come up 200 years, 18, 1900. Let's go back before the flood, people are living three, four, five hundred, six hundred, seven hundred 600, 700 years. We discover a hot air balloon. Do you think that those people living those lengths of lifespans over there could have come up with an airplane? If today, in modern times, and just going back three, four hundred years, modern times, 1700 to 1800 to 1900 to 2000, 17, 18, 19, 20, 300 years, that's not a stretch of imagination at all. In fact, I'd be surprised if they hadn't done it. Just think about it for a minute. Now, here's a secret called flight. <clears throat> So you thought that man flight began with the Wright brothers back in 1903. Would you be surprised? Would you believe that flying machines could cross the oceans and cover the vast distances between continents in the earliest times B.C.? Well, listen to this. People all over the world have re retained separate memories of a period when aviation was a well-known concept and flight was a frequent occurrence. And what's more, their writings demonstrate a knowledge of aerodynamics and an awareness of the factors of takeoff propulsion, braking, and landing. But first, I would like to draw your attention to some giant drawings found all over the world. And the question is, why are there so many of these designed to be seen only from above? So we take a look at petroglyphs, uh, petroglyphs made to be seen from the air. In England... The Long Man of Wilmington, Sussex, is a human outline, 226 feet long, formed by an immense ditch. The figure can be seen solely from above, and even then, one has to be high up. In England, the Gog and Magog giants on hills near Cambridge are of such dimensions as to suggest that their construction was controlled from the air. In England, there is a 360-foot-long white horse at Uffington in Berkshire Downs. In England, the famous hmm, C-E-R-N-E, Cern Abbas Giant, a 180-foot human figure, is outlined by chalk trenches on a Dorset hillside. In England, the great zodiac of Glastonbury was a huge stone calendar laid out in a circle 30 miles in circumference and apparently meant to be seen from above. In Wisconsin, in the United States, then there are the elephant and serpent mounds in Wisconsin, California, the Mojave Maze in Ohio, 
The Great Serpent Mound of Bush Creek, over 1,300 feet long. Its open jaws are 60 feet. In California, the horse, 40 feet long. The giantess, 87 feet high. And the giant, 96 feet tall. All three at Bly, California. Arizona, the 150 foot tall giant at uh, Sakaton, S-A-C-A-T-O-N. And in Louisiana, six enormous octagons with a total length of 11.2 miles near Poverty Point. Now, like the Nazca uh, uh, spider and monkey and so on, these can only be seen from the air. Why would you make something that you can't even recognize on the ground? How would you make it unless you had been in the air to direct its construction? These are, these are all sights. They're all there. They're all physical. They've been seen, weighed, touched, tasted, smelled, felt, photographed, documented. How come you and I never heard of them? I never heard of these things. You know, just taking a look here at the California. They say here, there's this California here, Bly, California. The horse, 40 feet long. A giantess, 87 feet high. And a giant, 96 feet long, tall. Never heard of such a thing. I've never heard of that. Now, there's a stylized figure of a man 330 feet long in Chile. There are said to be many other sites of the Nazca, uh, Nazca kind in Peru and Chile. Now, I've heard of the Nazca site, but I never heard that there were more of them. Now, that doesn't mean that I know everything. You know, I, <laughs> I'm i always learning something new. That's why I kind of like my job, because I, nearly every day, Dirk comes in here and hands me some report. It can be some economic report that's modern. It can be some uh, book. It can be some story that came from the four corners of the world someplace on China or someplace. I reported to you the other day. Did you know that there were pyramids larger than the Pyramid of Cheops? Now, I've been told all my life that that Great Pyramid is the biggest building, the biggest pyramid in the world. Come to find out that there's four or five more pyramids bigger than that one in China, for crying out loud. I didn't know that. Now, I've reported it to you, and the reason that I did that was because there's 969 of these reports. I said that if all of them were false except 10% of them, it would knock the theory of evolution right square in the in the head. And I don't have any reason to doubt that any of them are here. He has followed this up with footnotes. I mean, if you want to go take a look at the at the site, the document, the exhibit, you know, the maps are in here. The, the locations and the sites are there. You know, if you want to jump on a plane, run over to Britain, walk into the British Museum, the batteries are there. Now, I've known about that one for a long time. Now, not every single one of these is, is uh, hidden away someplace. Many of these are out on display. Which then leads me to ask the question, why aren't they all out on display? I mean, at least the pictures of them. Why don't we have more books than this, you know, that have pictures in our colleges and high schools and universities that say, hey, listen, you know, if you think that men were dumb and that they were dragging their knuckles on the back of the ground here a few thousand years ago, you know, clean up your act, start thinking straight. That wasn't the case. It may well be true that there were people walking around with their knuckles dragging on the ground like they are in in uh, Stone Age societies, the Aborigines in Australia, the Stone Age uh, cannibals of, uh, of uh, Indonesia. That's true, no doubt about it, but contemporaneous with them, there are space age men living, firing rockets off to the space station, for crying out loud. How come we're not told about that? It's been going on for a long time. Let's take a look at flight. Sumerian cylinder seals show great numbers of machines flying in the sky, as matter-of-factly as if it were a daily occurrence. British Isles, Druid legends, speak of magical machines capable of traveling on land, sea, and air. The Celts in Britain, Bran's chariot did not touch the water. Celts, uh, Mananin's flying machine took him from Ireland to England by night. Druid tradition in Britain, Abris of Britain traveling through the air to Greece with the aid of a golden arrow. Now, these, uh, these legends here, they sound, you know, like they're, oh, my God, you can't believe that. Well, let's picture this. Let's suppose an airplane flies over New Guinea in 1945, 1935, 1925. What do you think those Stone Age people are going to say? They're going to pass a tradition down. They're going to say something like, a great eagle flew over the jungle with men inside of it. 
Now, pass that down for 3,000 years, and what are you going to see? There's, there's a fact. They saw something. They didn't know what it was. They couldn't call it an airplane. How in the hell would a Stone Age Aborigine use the word airplane? We see the same thing going on in the book of Revelation when John was given a vision. And he's describing these scorpions with stings in their tails, controlled by men. And the flesh melting off of people's bodies. Today, we could visualize that very simply. It's a Apache helicopter with a sting in its tail, which is, or, or with, uh, with this uh, laser beam, or with machine guns, and with rockets firing off of it. But you know, for hundreds of years, people reading the book of Revelation, you know, they're looking mysteriously, superstitiously at these events and at these stories, at these legends, at these stories. So the Druids and many other people throughout history have these traditions. Well, what they're talking about here is you've got superior technologies in the United States flying airplanes over Stone Age, Stone Age people in, in, uh, in uh, Indonesia or on Borneo someplace, and these people on Borneo are telling what they saw. And then thousands of years later, we take a look at it, and my God, now they're actual, they're actual relics. In fact, he's got some pictures in here. Of uh, of relics. In fact, this section in here. Let's see how many there are. On page two ninety four, there are all kinds of models of airplanes. I mean, this is is absolutely uh, perfectly describable. This object. This is called Figure twenty six on page two ninety four. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten objects in here that have been dug up or brought out of tombs that are unmistakable airplanes. One of them here looks like. Looks like a model airplane that I built once. This object, once thought to be a bird, was found in a tomb in Egypt in 1898. Now picture this. Here's a, an archaeologist in 1898. He pulls a model airplane out of a tomb. He doesn't know what he's looking at. So he, he bundles it up. He says, well, this must be some kind of a religious object over here. They must be worshipping this thing. Doesn't have anything to do with worship. Doesn't have anything to do with religion. It has to do with science and technology. Stuffed in a box of bird models in one of Cairo Museum storerooms, it was rediscovered in 1969, and it was found to fly perfectly as a glider, though there are indications that it may originally have possessed a propulsion mechanism at the tail. The design is highly sophisticated. Here is a gold jet from Columbia, South America. Its features are more mechanical than biological. Experts at the Aeronautical Institute of New York concur that it does not represent any known type of winged creature. It appears to be a model of an ancient jet aircraft. That's from the Aeronautical Institute of New York. They took a look at it and said, this isn't a bird. This is a jet airplane. Which is exactly right. When it was dug up out of the tombs back in the 1800s, they looked at it and said, well, this must be a bird of some kind. They didn't know. Now, of course, they're not too anxious now to to put uh, these out on display. That's the tragedy of it. Here's the might ancient aircraft be found. Now, one is led to contemplate the intriguing possibility, however remote, of such a discovery. Could craft be of any size and surprising shapes? Well, did you notice how frequently ancient flying machines were described as shaped like an egg, or like a hat, or a sphere, or a disc in items 53, 61, 62, 74, and so on? Hell, we got flying discs today. We call them flying saucers. We've got hovercraft that, that hover over the water. And so, you know, when you pick up something like that in 1856 or 1898, what are you going to call it? They didn't know. Consider them in the context of what's preceded. After all, Professor W. B. Emery, who had spent most of his life digging in Egypt, did say there's more lying under the sands than has ever been found. There's more yet to be found. You know, they haven't found everything. His conclusion is there's more out there to be found than has been found. Then there's energy sources from sound waves generated by magnetized rods or, or hum, uh, uh, hammering. Sanskrit books state plainly that aircraft could be driven solely by the power of sound, tunes, and rhythms. Interestingly, in modern automobile tests, an ultrasonic reactor attached to a carburetor almost doubled petrol mileage with very little exhaust gas. The simple gadget is based on a system of harmonic resonance within atomic structure of liquids. How in the hell did ancients know anything about that? Hell, we're just experimenting with it today. We haven't de devised any specific technology with, uh, technology with uh, ultrasound. We know about it. We're working with it. Kind of like chirogenics, you know. 
All right, 969 of these records over here. Flight. Maybe next time we'll take a look at ancient weaponry and ancient science space travel, uh, engineering. There's much more in the book. Remember, it's called Dead Men's Secrets by Jonathan Gray. You can get a copy from bravenewbookstore.com. BraveNewBookstore.com. The number is 512-480-2503. Once more, that's 512-480-2503. Uh, one in 100 read, if I've ever seen one. Now, we've been talking about Dead Men's Secrets. It's a book on 969 uh, records around the world, historical records around the world, of, of events that have occurred in the past, building sites, it covers things like geography and astronomy, cosmology, mathematics, metallurgy, engineering, construction techniques, large-scale construction, things like that, that are totally unexplainable. Like the Nazca monuments in Peru with the spider that's sticking out there six by four miles. And then he's got his third leg sticking out there, which is this, this obscure spider, very rare breed of spider, that you can only watch their breeding uh, technique or their modality with that third leg which is critical to the reproduction which is contained in that monument you can only see it through a microscope so we got to ask questions you know like we're not getting the straight skinny from science we're not getting the straight skinny and history from our museums from archaeology paleontology and the sciences and that's because they all have an agenda they have an evolutionary agenda and anything that doesn't fit within that evolutionary framework that evolutionary mindset is eliminated and this book exposes 969 ancient records. Now, a lot of times people ask the question, well, where is the evidence? Where is the evidence? This guy's got 969 of these pieces of evidence. Pieces. It's the whole piece of evidence. It's all what we got left. So he has a chapter, chapter 9, on vanishing evidence. Let's listen to what happens to the evidence. Consider for a moment the awful possibility that your hometown was forever wiped out. Can you imagine what future generations might find in your hometown? Has it occurred to you that our noblest buildings today are scarcely more than facades supported by thin tendons of steel? Even with no disaster, our main cities would be little more than rubble in a thousand years. Our motorways would be crumpled pieces of hardness beneath vegetation. Our once complex railway network would be red dust blowing in the wind. And make no mistake about it, very few house chattels would survive the corrosion of time. Generally, paper books cannot last more than a few centuries, hence the need to recopy. Plastics will eventually disintegrate when exposed for long periods outside. The same goes for everything metallic. That's right. Your hair dryer, automobile, carpets would be reduced to dust, along with photographic plates and film. And what's more, all of the iron and steel buildings would rust and crumble to earth. Nothing would be left except a few stone structures downtown and maybe a few statues. Stone is the only indestructible material. It will survive a dead civilization. So isn't it ironic? Nature allows dressed blocks of stone to survive, but not thick iron girders. Probably, there would not be one item left in the suburbs to show that they even existed, except for the odd stone axe head. Now, to, in the event of a total catastrophe, the survivors would be driven to the countryside to live primitively. They might, for a time, be able to salvage and use certain elements of their civilized technology. Eventually, the last machine would break down with nobody remembering how to repair it. The transistors, the toasters, the x-ray machines. Even though they are revered today, they would be totally useless to us. To the grandchildren and their descendants, they would become legends the magic mirror that could see events far away, the metal bird that could fly above the clouds, the room that could move up and down inside of a big house. These would become magical myths of a people whose survival instinct would direct them back into the rapidly encroaching forests. Archaeologists 4,000 years in the future could claim that 20th century man was not yet familiar with iron. If they found cassettes with tapes, these would be meaningless puzzles to them. What do you think of that? Texts speaking of gigantic cities with houses several hundred feet high would be classified as myths. So do you begin to see the picture? It is this very situation of meager clues that confronts us in relation to the original super world, the Golden Age BC. Now, I can think of four reasons for this. 
First of all, most physical remains were wiped out. Numerous ancient cities now lie below ground level. Many are covered by desert sands or have been swallowed by dense jungle, while others still may lie intact under the mile-deep ice of Antarctica. On the other hand, exposed remnants can disappear very fast. Take, for example, the 4,000-year-old ruins in Bolivia. They're called Tiahascao. It's T-I-A-H-U-A-N-A-C-O. Tiahascao. As recently as the 17th century, there still stood immense walls with massive rivets of silver in the stonework, as well as lifelike statues of men and women in a thousand animated poses. Even until the last century, travelers could admire the sketch of imposing colonnades. Of these there is no trace today. The Spaniards, and more recently the Bolivian government, has totally plundered them for the building materials. Now again, many scale replicas of ancient apparatuses probably perished when the Spanish conquistadors melted down all of the gold artifacts that they could find in Central and South America. The scale of destruction over the centuries will never be known. Second, most ancient records have also been destroyed. The destruction of printed records has been much greater than was originally thought. The Great Library of Alexandria once contained a million volumes in which the entire science, philosophy, and the mysteries of the ancient world were recorded, including a complete catalog of authors in 120 volumes with a brief biography of each author. In a single act of vandalism, Julius Caesar destroyed 700,000 priceless scrolls in the Library of Alexandria. In the 7th century, the Arabs completed the wipeout. And do you know how they did it? Well, they used the books as a fuel supply to heat the city's 400 public baths for six months. Totally destroyed also were the papyri of the Library of Ptah in Memphis and Carthage. With a library of 500,000 volumes, it was raised in the 17-day fire by the Romans in 146 B.C. The library of Pergamos in Asia Minor, with 200,000 volumes, likewise perished. And when the famous collection uh, in Athens was wiped out in the 6th century, surprisingly, Homer's writer writings escaped. There have, in each one of these events, been some writings that have escaped, which tell us what it was that was destroyed, or at least gives us an insight as to how great this destruction was. In the 8th century, Leo Isaurus burned 300,000 books in Constantinople. In China, Emperor Tam Sui Huangti issued an edict in 213 BC to destroy innumerable books. Thousands of druidic scrolls in Autun, France, on philosophy, medicine, astronomy, and other sciences were obliterated by Julius Caesar. Not one survived. In modern times, the Nazis in Germany burned books and destroyed the literature and the culture of millions of people. Much classical literature was systematically destroyed by the Papal Inquisition during the Middle Ages. Spanish conquerors searched out and destroyed the entire Mayan literature except for four documents now in a European museum. It was related that Mayan scholars screamed in agony as they saw their life's purpose go up in flames. Some committed suicide. The Council of Lima in 1583 dec decreed the burning of the knotted cords called the quipus on which the Incas had recorded their history and that of their predecessors. Now what a story of carnage a carnage in which the great depositories of knowledge from the ancient world were destroyed and lost forever. And yet somehow the Indian books escaped. Now did you know that even of the Greek and Roman literature, less than 1% has survived to come down to us today? So is it any wonder that we are ignorant of our early heritage? I agree with Andrew Thomas that we have to depend upon disconnected fragments, casual passages, and meager accounts. Our distance past is a vacuum filled at random with tablets, parchments, statues, paintings, and various artifacts. The history of science would appear totally different today were the book collection of Alexandria with us to this day. And third, even where it was not lost, much of it remains a mystery. Undeciphered still are writings at Easter Island, tablets at Mahindo Dera in Pakistan, and Mayan scripts. Some finds will remain unsolved forever.
There are no inscriptions awaiting us at Tiacano or Malco Picci. There were some museum relics whose significance may have eluded us. A methodical re-examination of pieces labeled art objects, cult objects, and unidentified objects could yield much new data in the future. So would a systematic exploration of the museum vaults today. It is a well-known fact that museums are in the habit of burying objects that do not coincide with current theories or political ideologies or that are not beautiful to look at. The vaults of the Smithsonian Institution and the Museum of Prehistory of St. Germain are full of crates of incomprehensible objects that nobody is studying and nobody can recognize at first sight. So could it be that many objects that we have discovered really do have a purpose that we simply do not yet understand. The ancients may have achieved results similar to ours by quite different processes. For instance, look at what happened to German technology. German technology diverged tremendously from that of the other countries in the world in the 1930s in just 12 years from 1933 to 1945 when Germany was progressively isolated from the rest of the world. Then again, is it possible that some of the antediluvian artifacts that we have found cannot yet be identified simply because they are still far ahead of our technology today? So a point to remember, as any technology advances, its methods and equipment do not become more complex. They become simplified. Take, for example, printed circuits, silicon chips. Such equipment may not be recognizable to a civilization of inferior knowledge. Computer chips, for instance, would not be recognizable by a civilization on Borneo, for instance. The point is, we may be looking at objects, quite exciting objects, in fact, without even recognizing them. Who would have expected that items in Baghdad in the museum, long labeled as ritual objects, would have to be components of batteries? Now, do you see what I mean? When they were first discovered in 1885, nobody knew what a battery looked like. It wasn't until 1969 that those batteries in the Museum of Baghdad were recognized for what they were and then identified as batteries. That tells us that electricity was known. Electroplating was known. We know that from metallurgical objects today. Now, here's a tantalizing thought. Other relics still await discovery. Some authentic and incredibly ancient documents are known to be safely locked away. You and I may never see them. These forbidden treasures are known to be concealed in four places. First, in the catacombs beneath the Potala in Lhasa, Tibet. The vaults in the Vatican Library, to which even the Pope does not have access. In Morocco, where Muslim leaders are fiercely opposed to making them public and a secret place known to a few initiated rabbis believed to be in Spain. But that isn't all. There must be numerous lost cities yet to be discovered. Hold it, I hear you say. That's overdoing things, isn't it? An occasional ruin, maybe, but numerous lost cities? There aren't any unknown areas in this day and age. Ah, but on the contrary, there are many totally unexplore, unexplored areas left about. Quite a lot of things occur in and out of the way, out of the way corners of the world, and some not so out of the way that most persons have never heard of. Still not explored from the ground are immense expanses of the interior of Central and South America, New Guinea, Asia, and Australia. And all the Europeans have lived and worked in India for several centuries building bridges, railways, and modern cities. The jungles have scarcely been touched. There are remote villages that have never seen a white man in India today. In the trackless central Australian desert, a structure from an unknown civilization was discovered when vehicles from a nearby atomic test site drove into it purely by accident. Now what you shall see in part two is just a hint of what still awaits us in the desert, the jungle, and the ocean. The largest unexplored jungle area in the world is the Amazon Basin. This region is so little known that a river tributary, 200 miles long, was only recently discovered and then only by satellite. The Amazon system comprises 50,000 miles of navigable trunk rivers and an estimated 16,000 tributaries. The jungle on each side of the rivers is almost totally impenetrable, at least for Europeans. Now, I know of settlers who have lived on riverbank clearings for 40 years and never ventured more than a mile back into the jungle. 
There now follows about 1,000 of the more interesting exhibits, that yet these can never be more than a tantalizing peep at this astonishing unknown world, shrouded in opaque clouds of mystery. The Amazon contains some of the most solid jungles and hostile environments to be found anywhere. And surprisingly, this now mysterious region was once the center of a very intense and highly active population. Large cities flourished there, with high volume commercial traffic to the Andes. And despite satellite technology, we face almost insurmountable problems in locating many of these remains. A pilot over the Amazon may spy towers, villages, or ruins, and pinpoint them and report them. A few days later, someone setting out to verify the data will find that they've already vanished, swallowed again by the jungle, since that forest fire or whim of nature or weather that exposed them in the first place. Carl Brueger mentions that the Trans-Amazonia spur of the road between Manaus and Barcelos on the lower Rio Negro built 1971 was overgrown by tropical vegetation within one year. The technicians even had difficulties locating the approximate direction of the road. It's not surprising, therefore, that there are no more signs of white cities. Again, there are vast stretches where the fog never lifts and in others it doesn't clear until late afternoon. There's an area in eastern Ecuador from which natives have been carrying out thousands of artifacts belonging to what they described as a giant pyramid and immense deserted cities. So don't get carried away. This is a forbidden region. Local Indians still massacre inquisitive outsiders. Intruders in the Mato Grosso region of Brazil can expect a similar welcome. Yes, you can believe it. Documented accounts are numerous, and once an entire patrol of 1,400 vanished in the jungle without a trace, this trackless, unexplored green hell swallows visitors, and the ruins clasp their secrets. So think of it. 5,000 years ago, when our forefathers were supposed to be existing in caves or crude settlements, there were highly advanced cultures, and they reached over the entire world, from Siberia to Antarctica, from Greenland to Africa. This super world vanished, and it vanished so completely that we thought that it never existed. It's not unlikely that a whole empire could disappear like this. The more advanced the culture, the more easily it could vanish without a trace. If it were so advanced, then its powers of destruction must also have been enormously advanced. But more on that later. What an epic. The wonder is that despite wholesale obliteration of the evidence, there are still many thousands of pieces that do survive, written records, oral traditions, and physical remains. So let's take a look at some of these physical remains again. We've been looking at about um, about 19 of these. Remember, there's geography, astronomy, cosmology, mathematics, metallurgy, large-scale construction, construction techniques, social organization, engineering, mechanical devices, everyday items, clothing, art, medicine, flight, space travel, ancient science, civilization, electricity, and weaponry. There are 969 sites around the world where these types of artifacts from civilization, yes, indeed, advanced civilizations with space travel, flight, electricity, that we have discovered and that we know about today. Let's take a look at one. Metallurgy. There are 44 sites or examples of advanced metallurgy technology in the world today that is hidden or suppressed or just plain misunderstood. So on page 131 we have metallurgy. Let me flip over here to page 131. The Sad Fate of the Gold Gardens, Chapter 14, 44 Examples of Metallurgy. When the Spanish conquerors entered Peru, they came upon an island near Puna, P-U-N-A, on which was a royal garden, so astonishing it might have come out of a fairy tale. Every living thing was reproduced in gold and silver models. Trees, even to the roots, and lesser plants with leaves, flowers, and fruit, fashioned in natural size and style, some ready to sprout others half-grown or in full blossom. Golden birds sat perched on silver trees as if singing and while others were flying and sucking honey from flowers. Whole fields of maize were imitated. Roots, stalks, flowers, and the cob. The beard of the husk in gold, the rest in silver. 
Other plants were similarly treated. A flower or anything of a yellow tint in real life was done in gold. The other parts were done in silver. And from the trees hung nuggets of fruit. Nothing remained uncopied. Rabbits, foxes, mice, lizards, lions, tigers, stags, snakes, all were set in their natural surroundings to enhance reality. And as if that were not enough, golden butterflies flitted around in the breeze. Life-size fish, ropes, hampers, baskets, bins, and even wood piles for burning were all fashioned in gold and silver and then soldered together. Such gardens, would you believe, graced all of the royal residences throughout the land. The others were disassembled before the treasure-lusting invaders could reach them. So carefully were these artifacts hidden that they have never been found. And regretfully, most of that, or most of what is upon, such that the invaders did lay their hands, was melted down for shipment to Europe. So vanished an unbelievably precise metal technology. But the Incas were heirs to a much earlier culture. And, as we shall see, the evidence for an advanced knowledge of metallurgy in the remote past is irrefutable. The following examples are but representative. So, wait for the surprises. Now, each of us has probably heard or read in Reader's Digest or seen on, you know, something on television, some special or some <clears throat> some odd piece of history like the History Network or the, the History Channel. But not all 969 of them. I have never heard of the pyramids over in China. That was a new one to me. In fact, most of the information contained in this book is new to me, which made me say to myself, why is this being suppressed? And it isn't Jonathan Gray here who is suppressing it. He's revealing that the Smithsonian Institution, the Chicago Museum of Natural History, the London Museum, the great institutions around the world have, are now, and will continue in the future to systematically hide and obfuscate these tremendous finds of archaeology. And remember, these have been found by the natural, normal, everyday garden variety archaeologists, the guys that are out here, uh, that are the mainstream of archaeological study. Not found, you know, in most cases, are not found, you know, by Joe Sixpacks and Sally Housewives. And then when these treasures are found, they don't fit the theory of evolution. And so they hide them. They say, wait a minute, this isn't politically correct. So they put it in a crate and hide it in the vault. They hide it in the basement. They put it in a warehouse. Now, here are some examples. Now, listen, if, if we've got here, in this case, 44 examples, there are hundreds more that are being hidden. And the guy's name is Jonathan Gray, and the book is called Dead Men's Secrets. It's put out by Teach Services. That's the publisher, Teach, T-E-A-C-H, Services. They've got a web page. It's www.teachservices.com. It's easy enough, Teach Services. Now, that teach services is all one word, but the first letters, that is T-E-A-C-H-S, is in caps, and then the E-R-V-I-C-E-S is in lowercase. So it's www.teachservices.com. And if you can't find a copy of it there, or you're having some kind of a problem, don't forget, you can always get these underground books, or these strange, odd books, from bravenewbookstore.com. That's bravenewbookstore.com in Austin, Texas. Brave New Bookstore has a phone number, too. If you want to jot it down, it's 512-480-2503. Once more, that's area code 512-480-2503. That's Brave New Bookstore. They will help you reveal the truth of the matter. All right, now the following examples are but representative, so wait for some surprises. In Colombia, 2,000 years ago, in Ezion Giber in Israel 3,000 years ago, in northeast Siberia 3,000 years ago, in Tiahunco, Bolivia, Spain, and Spain 3,000 years ago, we have found smelting of metals and blast furnaces. That's important. These, these blast furnaces are the modalities by which we introduce oxygen into the steel making process. Now that wasn't discovered until after the Civil War. Blast furnaces. Steel. In Madzamor, Armenia, 2500 B.C., a steel mill with 200 furnaces, about the oldest factory known. The workers wore gloves and covered their mouths with protective filters, just as they do today. 
in various places, steel objects have been found. Now this is important because steel is something different than iron. Now iron is made without the introduction of oxygen into the steel making process, but steel is made through the process of metallurgy. Metallurgy is where you take steel and you put other things into it. For instance, you might put tungsten into the iron in order to make steel. You might put nickel into it in order to make stainless steel and so on. Now, there's a, there's a place here in the Bible that gives us this story. Listen to this. This is in Genesis 4, verse 22. It says, And Zillah, she also bare Tubalcain, an instructor of every artificer in brass and iron. And the sister of Tubalcain was Nama. That's N-A-A-M-A-H. These people, these people were artificers in brass and iron in Genesis chapter 4. And I pointed this out to you the other day that we were still casting cannon and sand for crying out loud in Columbus's time. We didn't have any metallurgy in 1500. We had metals. We didn't have metallurgy. That's the combining of metals to make something else like brass. Which is, which is something that you mix metals to make brass. You don't dig brass out of the ground. Same thing is true with tin. You mix tin with other things. And then you make metallurgy out of tin, copper, iron. And when you mix these metals together, you get other components. That's what metallurgy is all about. When you go to make aluminum, that's a process that's only been discovered in the last hundred years. And yet, we have aluminum artifacts coming out of tombs and pyramids all over the world. How in the hell did these people make aluminum without electricity? We have to have electricity to make aluminum. All right, now there's the clue that comes from the Bible. Now, in various places, such as um, Cube, Austria, pre-flood, an ingot in India, 4th century B.C., nails in Britain, pre-flood, tweezers in Armenia, 2500 B.C., reinforced concrete in the United States, shields in Ecuador, a wheel rim in England, 100 BC. That's steel. Now there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven instances of steel artifacts being found. Boys and girls, it's one thing to find iron and then say this is the Iron Age. It's another thing to find bronze and say, well, this is the Bronze Age. But when you find steel, boys and girls, that's advanced metallurgy. That's something that we haven't seen in modern times until the last 200 years. Now let's take a look at bronze. Bronze has been found in Samaria, Egypt, Central America, South America, and in Thailand. Here's the importance of this. Notice that bronze is found all over the world. It isn't that we found some civilization with bronze in Samaria. But if we find bronze in Samaria, why do we find it in Egypt, Central America, South America, and in Thailand all at the same time? Well, it indicates then that these people were communicating with each other. When you find a pyramid in Mexico, which is an exact copy or replica of a pyramid that you find in Egypt, do you conclude that, gee, look at these Aztecs and these Incas and these Mayas. They were building pyramids that looked just like the Egyptian pyramids, but they never had any contact with one another. They just happened to build the same design and architecture independently of one another. Oh, I don't think so. I think that the skyscrapers you see in Hong Kong are copies of skyscrapers that those people over there in the Orient saw us building here in New York and Chicago. You know, prior to 1900, there were not very many buildings that were very tall. I know in San Francisco, the Call Building in 1906, which was destroyed in 1906 in the 1906 earthquake, was about 20 stories. Now, that's in 1900, a 20-story building. That's a big skyscraper in 1900. Little by little, over time, we've built buildings. By 1935, we had a 100-story building called the Empire State Building. Other buildings, 100 stories tall, have been built in Chicago and in other cities in the world, which indicates that there is a communication between the Chinese and the English and the Americans and the Canadians and the Brazilians, and they have copied skyscraper building technology over the past 100 years. There's a worldwide civilization extant over planet Earth today. And there was a worldwide civilization extant over the world in the past. That's what the artifacts tell us. That's not what evolution tells us. It's not what archaeology, it's not what politics are reporting to us. It's not what we read in our history or in our archaeology or in our paleontology books in colleges and high school. But the evidence is very plain.
Bronze is a hard alloy made of copper with the addition of one-tenth part tin. Now, it should have taken ages to discover that the addition of one-tenth part of tin to copper creates a better metal. But copper artifacts in our museums are few. Bronze seems to have appeared suddenly and spread far and wide in great profusion everywhere, including the Americas. This alloy appears quite suddenly in China and among the Canaanites. The hardening of bronze to the strength of high-grade steel, harder than we can produce today. We still do not understand this technique of hardening bronze as hard as steel. Now, boys and girls, come on, come on, let's wake up and get real. Today, we take a look at our skyscrapers, and they're made out of steel, which is hard, which is strong. We're pretty accomplished people today. You know, we 